Hello and welcome to Feedback Fridays. My name is Carrie. I am your host today and every Friday. I run a community space called Artist Strong. You're currently on the Facebook page, Becoming Artist Strong, or watching this on YouTube as a replay. And I am really happy to have you here today. Every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard, I offer artists feedback on their art website, on their artwork, on finding voice, technique instruction or ideas, anything that I can do to help you make the art that you really want to make. Today, I think I have four artists that I'm hoping to get to today. Last week, we cut out early for some reason. My silly technology was not behaving. So I'm going to start straight away with the website that I finished with last week in hopes that I can help this woman um, make sure she gets all the feedback she needs. And let's remember, even though I'm giving specific people feedback, you can apply all of the things you learn to your own art. So think about that. Think about how you can use today's feedback to help you make the art that you want to make. So that being said, I'm going to switch to her website and her question again. So her question was, um, okay, um, I want to critique um, about my website. And then she had a question if someone buys art where the artist should sign the work. Is it on the front or back of the canvas, initials or full name or web name? And I would love critiquing. So the first thing I want to share with that is um, also, you know, if you're joining me live, pop on and say hi, give me a wave. Let me know that you're, you're here and tell me where you're watching from. I'm going to just check real quick too to make sure we're actually live so that I don't have the same problem we did last week. Um, but um, I think Sandy's got a really good question about signing our artwork. It's entirely up to us how we sign our art. If you're selling work, then I think it's important to have some kind of branding on it that people, then if, if it's hanging in someone's home and they see those initials or the name, or they can ask the, the person who, who purchased it, it's easy for them to refer back to the work so that they can share your work. Um, initially, people started signing their names in the Renaissance so that they started to receive credit for the art that they did to help them get more commissions. So if you are doing this to sell your work, then find a way to sign it. Um, like from what I've read with art historians or um, kind of art conservation, they really like when you also write your full name or sign it on the back side of the artwork in addition to on the front that helps with authenticity um, or uh, excuse me authentication later in life um, later in the artworks life so that's just you know there is no right or wrong way to sign a work and if you really don't want to you don't have to either I would also argue that over time as you find your voice your work has a signature because you've made it and your style is clear and visible so that's the first kind of thing so um, let's look at Sandy's website it's called hidden code studios and nice um, the last time I looked at it she had a different header that was kind of a ceiling with lights and I had mentioned that it felt a little confusing to me about what I was here for and immediately here I see the word studio and I see people looking at art so I feel like I'm in a studio space so that definitely helps set a tone for people coming to this website and she's got some work here immediately that are some featured works for sale so it's really nice because we immediately see a bunch of artwork it goes straight to kind of um, product options that you can see to learn more and then as you scroll we go to her my art or about me um, something I'd really like to see here is I wish we could see all of Sandy's lovely smile there. I feel like we only see a small bit of her. And one reason, one way we build trust on our website is to be very transparent. So that means like having photos of ourselves and, you know, sharing a bit about ourselves. That Those are ways to build trust with potential collectors. I've personally found that the people who are interested in my art are also interested in me as a person and they like the art because they like me. So the more we can kind to open ourselves up to potential collectors I think that's a great way to build trust because think about it if you're a stranger coming on a website you know how do you know someone's actually gonna you know mail the artwork that you've you know that they've purchased from your website or ordered people still have some trust around that and giving out their financial information to someone they don't know rightfully so so that's something we need to be thinking about as artists is if our website is intended to network or offer opportunities for people to buy our art, what can we do with our website that will help build that trust and make it easy for people too? 
I do like that there's a little bit about her so that we can kind of get an idea of who she is on this. Um, she's got a personal statement down here. Um, I don't know how many people will actually download it. Um, I think it might be nice to have that as a separate page. And then we've got a gallery and another gallery and another gallery. So I'm starting to feel like this, this homepage is never ending. And, uh, we start to lose people if they keep scrolling forever and, and don't have to go somewhere else. I feel like we actually have maybe something like, you know, five or six different pages that could be part of her website. I think that each, um, you know, she could have a whole video section that's um, kind of talks about some of the stories that she has about her work. Um, and that could be a whole separate page up on her menu right? So she could have a menu up at top here that has kind of different storytelling. I like the featured products for sale and the about me. Um, I think that makes it really clear. And then I think everything else underneath could be a separate page. You could have smaller thumbnails of each gallery to lead people to the gallery, but this is a lot to see all on one page. Um, and though it's lovely to see, I like these hands, they're beautifully drawn. Um, so that's something for, for all of you to think about too, is how can you you want to make the viewing experience really easy for people and feel clean and kind of open and, you know, beautiful color here in this photograph. Um, but, you know, if there's lots and lots here, we can get overstimulated and, and be a little overwhelmed and that can make people click away too. So um, very prolific artist here. So let's, let's dedicate a page for a paintings gallery so that people can go to your paintings gallery to see these things. Let's have a page just for your photography. Let's have a page for your sketches and drawings. Let's have a page where you actually share your mission action statement, your personal content and videos, and have it written right on the page there for people to know you more. And you can be kind of selective, but then choose kind of which, um, which ones you'll have up here on your menu section because people want to get to know you. So I think it doesn't hurt to have an about me or um, kind of about the artist as something people could click on. And that could lead to some other things. And I also think it's quite helpful to have um, a menu option that says gallery, and then you can have sub menu options under it that lead to the specific galleries you have. So I think those would be all really good, helpful organizational choices to make on this website. So Sandy, I hope this gives you some more feedback and ideas for it. Thank you so much for sharing your website with us. Um, I'm happy to have you here. Hey Carmen, I just saw you've joined me. I hope you're doing well today. So yeah, I think uh, that's something for us to think about. How can we have our websites kind of clean and easy for people to see and, and help them? And um, you guys are more than welcome to look at my website as an example. I had someone help me design the templates for the website. So uh, Nicola Y. Sturt helped me design um, templates to help me kind of create it. But so you can see, I have a menu option that says meet the artist. It's my about me, but also it talks about how I'm um, giving money back from artwork that I sell, my exhibitions and awards. Um, I have a gallery section that lists every kind of kind of gallery of artwork I have on my website so people can go and look. And I also have a contact section. And when I scroll here, I have some artwork on my page, but I also have kind of a gallery section um, that shows a hint of some of the artwork. And it's not all of it. It's just three different categories of my galleries that people then could click on to learn more. Um, I also have a section that lets people lead to the whole gallery. So you don't scroll super long on my page. Um, so feel free to look at that as an example. Okay, great. Um, so uh, let's see, I think Trisha, I think I was trying to give you some feedback too. Let me um, get a new page open here. Sorry, that's gonna be confusing for a minute. I'll make sure we're still live and running. Sometimes when I switch this, I feel like things turn off on me. Looks like we're okay. So Trisha, Trisha said that I'd love feedback on my artwork listed in the original oil paintings on my website, trishaart.com. Did I type that right? Okay. Something for all of you to think about too is as you watch this, if you have ideas, hi Angela, thanks for coming to and joining us today. If you have ideas about someone's website or the artwork we're sharing, remember feedback is about offering information. It's not about being critical or mean to someone. It's saying, you know what, I 
I'm, I'm kind of interested, what would the website look if it was like this? Or I'm kind of wondering if you change the color scheme of this painting and it had more of this color in it, what would that look like? Those don't feel threatening or mean to someone or telling them that they're doing it wrong. It's just showing them that you have a different perspective that might help them make decisions. And when we offer feedback, that doesn't mean the artist has to take it either. The idea is, is an artist can collate and collect all of this feedback from different people and then really make an informed decision about the art and their website. So um, oil paintings is what she said she'd like some feedback on. I want to just double check what she said too while this is loading um, on my artwork. So she's not looking for feedback on the website. She's looking for feedback on the artwork. Um, well, uh, beautiful landscapes is kind of my initial reaction. I'm really drawn to these poppies and how they kind of fill the space on the right. Um, I really like how the spaces do feel full in these compositions. Um, same with the lotus. Um, something I am somewhat like curious about or feel some mild concern is um, in terms of compositional choice, there's something called a tangent. And a tangent is when, so if we look at this lotus, for example, I don't know if I can enlarge it. I'm trying. Yeah, if we look at this lotus, we can see this top petal, how it almost just touches the edge of the top of the frame. When things are th this close like this, and this almost feels like an arrow that's pointing to it, that can actually cause a distraction with our eyes that make us focus on those points. So I see it there, and I see here how it's just over the edge. So what I've read in terms of compositional rules is that people say that you either have it really, really go off the edge, or you make sure there's really a kind of spacious border, kind of more like some of the edges on the right or left of this lotus that helps create, um, I don't know what the word is, but it's it's like a visual calmness to the, to the work. So understand that so you can Google something, you can Google art in tangents or composition and tangents. Um, I'm saying that word so much, I feel like it's losing its meaning. I'll spell it too, T-A-N-G-E-N-T-S. So that's something that um, I think could help Trisha. Her use of color is really nicely done. Um, I like how, again, those poppies, I just love that blue and red next to each other. There's this kind of vibrancy in it that's really, really nice. And it's, you know, that green and red really contrast well together. And then that blue, um, really quite nice. Um, I really like this play with as well. That's quite that's that's fun. Oh, in this perspective too, this frog garden. Um, these works are quite nice. I really like the natural feel to them. Something I'd like. Um, let's click on the poppy one a little closer to see too is you know we see a title for the work and the price and and you do have a description here so a vividly beautiful scene of blooming poppies on a hill um, i find from the research i've done that the more storytelling we can do with art the more likely people are going to invest in the work. So it's really helpful if we have some more description and I, that's something I would like more of. I'd love some more story to read about. And it doesn't mean that people can't interpret it in their own way, but think about how you want people to experience the work and, and talk about those experiences. I think that could be really helpful in terms of promoting work. Um, the other thing too is I have no idea what the size are of these upon initial glance, but I see the price. And so that that might be interesting too, if you could include the size on the main page. Um, that's something to think about. Uh, I don't know what else to offer in terms of technique about the artwork itself. Uh, I do think compositional study or research would be really kind of just a whole nother level for you to up level the work. Your use of the medium and you know, like especially some of these reflective surfaces is really nicely done. I don't I don't see a need to kind of change that. I love even your your cabin mushroom, just the shadow underneath the mushroom really helps give it a sense of three dimension and, and space in in the image. So um, yeah, I'm I'm really glad you shared your work with us, Trisha. There's so much here and uh, it's lovely. Hmm. I guess one other thing I might do on the page itself is I might kind of put pieces that have more architectural elements in the same row. So I might put the birth gnome 
um, my aunt's perspective in the frog garden kind of in one row together because they have kind of more architectural elements. And then I could keep kind of some of these other pieces together too, uh, just, just for kind of a theme kind of layout. Um, I know you didn't necessarily ask for website feedback, but some of that's some of what's coming from me from seeing these works together. Um, it's very clear to me that you you have a skill set here and you have a passion for this kind of theme of work of nature and kind of challenging yourself with things like reflections. Um, and I, I like that you start at the beginning talking about kind of your passion for this. Um, it'd be great to have more story there too, because that's some of what people really want to see. Um, so yeah, I think really in terms of feedback on your art, it depends on what you want next for yourself. Do you want more challenge? Are you looking to promote the works you already have here and sell more of it? You know, where where are you with your art and goals? And, and use that kind of that feeling and desire of wherever you're reaching for to help determine what you what you want to paint next or how you want to proceed with your art. I love that gnome. He's so great. Yeah, beautiful work. Um, of course, if any of you have follow-up questions after hearing some of this feedback today, you can absolutely um, ask those follow-up questions as well. Um, so let's see where we at. I think, oh, okay, I've got um, a work here by Leanne, and um, she worked on this piece, it's an ink piece, last week, and she said, um, I'd really like feedback on my pen skills and how to have smoother transitions. So um, when we're working with pen, um, something to think about is obviously you can't erase away or necessarily have the same kind of gradation just from like applying pressure the way we would with a pencil. I got to get my, I forgot to get out my tablet so I can draw on it. So I'm going to do that while we're chatting. Um, so when you're working with something like ink, it's important for you to think about how can you create gradation if you want kind of a more realistic approach to the drawing that you're doing. And you can use all kinds of the same drawing techniques that you would with a pencil. So I'm gonna open up a screen on my Photoshop right now. And we already have, I already have her, her bat here, but I'm gonna make it a little bigger for us so that we kind of only see the bat and that should help the screen be a little less Kind of confusing. Um, and then I'm actually going to make a new blank one too, just so that we can talk about some of these textural marks. So let's start by talking about some of the kind of mark making you can do with a pencil and uh, think about how you can apply it for ink, right? So um, you might have in the past had uh, a drawing class or something that had you make kind of a grid like this, where you had to have kind of your darkest dark, right? And then you had to grade down to white. So this would be white, and then this would be kind of like a darker gray, and then this would be a lighter gray, right? And it, it progresses in steps um, to light to dark or dark to light. So what you can do with something like this too is you don't just have to fill in a block, right? You can, you can have all kinds of different ways to create your values, and that's ultimately what Leanne's asking for here. And what I've seen by an artist who makes super hyper real work, which I'm going to show us in a, on a website page in a minute, is she uses stipple. And she works with pencil, ink, everything, you name it. And she uses stipple to create such soft transitions that you would think her work is a photograph. And so I'm sharing that not because that has to be the way you do it, but I think that in the case of Leanne's bats, that if she had some more stipple that kind of transitioned with greater distance, right? So I'm just kind of trying to create the, the gradation here in uh, one box. Stipple is really time consuming. Um, you should hear a classroom of high school students doing stipple together as one of the gradation steps. I make them do that in assignment and it was just classroom just you hear that dot 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 of a pencil or a pen over and over again so so repeating stipple can help create transitions and you can even better stipple looks a lot better on top of another tone so if you had filled in an area even with something like a crosshatch um, which is another way to create 
um, your value, right, is how close together you put your, your hatch marks, your hash marks. You can do this over and over again, and that helps create um, uh, gradation steps of dark to light. Right? And you can also change the direction in which you put them in. Um, this can have a much more stylized approach. And so again, for realism, I do think that the stipple is kind of the way to go. So let's let's go to our bat here. So we can see kind of here that she has some dots. Um, so if she wanted to have a softer transition on the bat's wings between where the light really comes through and where it doesn't, I would have a load of stipple kind of right along this edge here. So just just the stipple, I would be filling in kind of all along this edge to create a transition. The other place that I could see her possibly wanting it, right, is we can see in the face of our bat here. Um, let's get a little closer. Let's see if I can zoom in. Nice. Oops, if it will let me. It's not letting me open it more. Come on. Well, fine, you guys can see that. So um, in the face too, if she wanted to kind of right along the edge where she's having those um, marks, let's see if I can pick the color. How am I doing for time? Got one more person today too I'd like to get to. Um, so I need to change my pen size. Oops. There we go, it's a little smaller. So using the same gray pen, she could create dots kind of over and over again, just kind of right along the line on top of that black line, because she does have a darker ink pen there too. And she could use the darker ink pen as well. So she could go back and forth between her darker color as well and kind of stipple on top of each other on top of that line and I think you can see it's starting to already create a sense of transition there and then she could have depending on how many steps of gray she has she could also use this gray kind of as the last transition before it gets to the full highlight um, I think that would really kind of help and the same with with the trees if she wanted to have kind of more detail um, she could use the same kind of lovely scribble marks she's used I love some of the movement that's created in here because of her scribbles um, that's a great way to create um, different steps and gradations of value so she could con she could consider that as well personally for this drawing um, it's quite nice that they're kind of one tone more or less so that our focus is really on the bat um, and the artist that I want to recommend you all look like um, look at is uh, an artist named CJ Hendry so I need to um, get to her website again she is amazing she's um she actually has she's much more um, on her Instagram so let's see if I can find her And then I might have to wait for Tia. There we go. Excellent. I think this is her. Sometimes her work is not safe for work viewing, if you know what I mean. So we'll see what she has currently up. Yeah, so here, here are some great examples. So this is a pencil drawing that she's done. Um, and the transition is totally stipple. And I know that's pencil and we've been talking ink, but she has ink work. So here's a great example of some of her ink work where she's using ink pens. And I don't want you guys to feel like you have to be as realistic as this woman is, but I want to show you just how far you can go with the medium of ink if realism is something you're interested in it can this just knowing this or being able to practice to aim to move in this direction informs any art that you make if you understand that you can really push the limit of a tool you're using it's going to inform the work whether it's realistic or abstract or or even non-objective so understand that this is a tool you can really work with and you can see her stipple really well kind of where her pen is currently on the drawing but even softly kind of in some of the curls and curves of the ribbon that started so i really think stipple is a powerful tool although it takes a lot of patience that can really help you um, kind of take your art to the next level and cj hendry um, is the woman on instagram that i follow and i obsess over her art all the time Okay, I do think I have a little bit more time to talk about Tia's work here. She just she said she was looking for feedback, but I don't even remember that there was a specific um, question. 
Uh, okay, here it is. Um, I'm wondering about shadows more. I'm worried about muddying it up. For future works, does anyone see symbolism in it? Um, yeah, so that's some of the feedback she's looking for in her lovely drawing here. So let me see if I can... I want to enlarge it again. There we go. So I definitely see symbolism here. I'd be interested to see what some of you viewers think as well. Um, I like it. It's very narrative. There's lots of storytelling in these images. I feel like I'm seeing um, like Victorian era or um, something from another time period, these kind of quiet moments from people. Um, I really love how the face is reflected in the mirror. It really becomes a focal point because we're looking at the mirror and then the, the person in the mirror looks like they're looking stra straight at us, which also kind of comes down to this. So there's some really good compositional choices here. And again, I love how she kind of plays with the frame. Um, I think that's really, really nicely done. Um, and that really adds some some dimension to this work. I don't think that she needs to do anything else to this work. Um, something that you could all consider is if you're not sure and you want to add to work, scan it and then play with it digitally or even print out a copy of the work, right? You could print out a copy of a photograph of one of your artworks and then draw into it to test. You know, because I guess I could see there's some really lovely designs and movement with this. You know, what would it look like if there really was kind of the shading under the folds of this dress? That might be really interesting, um, but it could also be distracting from the goal of this piece, which, you know, our, our primary focus is the mirror, the light, and the girl looking at us through the mirror. So these are these aren't kind of black and white decisions to be made. These are these are the kinds of choices we need to think about when we're we have a work and it does look finished. But sometimes you wonder, am I really done? Is there something else I could be doing? Um, yeah, I mean, even without the text, I think there's a lot of meaning and story in this work. Um, I don't know that I would have known this text. I would have not thought about this notion of blame looking at this work, though I do feel sussed out or being analyzed by the woman in the image. Um, it'd be really great to hear what you all feel like when you see this work too. Um, there is a sense of kind of like eeriness or I don't know, kind of caught in the moment. That gray does a really good job of kind of setting this kind of somber mood um, that's either kind of a little sad or a little creepy. There's something There's something kind of along those edges for me. I think of Edgar Allan Poe a little bit when I look at this work. So I hope this gives Tia some feedback as well. Now, Something I want you all to realize is you can also get feedback on your art. Um, I am currently up to date with everyone who has offered or asked for feedback, offered their art. So if you would like feedback on your art or artist website in a future Feedback Friday, you can email me your work, carrie at artiststrong.com, or you can message me through our Facebook page, Becoming Artist Strong, and let me know what you're looking for in terms of feedback. I would love to also help you out. And this Feedback Friday is actually a taste of the support and community you can experience inside my program called The Circle. Early bird pricing for my program opens up next week, and that's only available to people who are part of my email community. So I'll make sure you have sign up details below the video. It's a six month mastermind that's designed to help artists find their voice, start building that portfolio they want to build, or even start trying to promote their work to share it with a larger audience. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, make sure that you use my sign up link that I'll offer below this video so that you can learn more about the program. And thank you so much guys for being here this week. I really look forward to seeing more of your art in a future Feedback Friday. Thanks Carmen and Angela for joining me live and anyone else who's watching this. Don't forget you can always comment below even after and let's keep that conversation going. <laughs>